joining us uh, for the third day of the Religious Freedom Mobile Institute. We're so excited that you're with us. I want to go back and thank our sponsors um, because they have been absolutely incredible in supporting us for the last three days and actually leading up to this event. Um, and so we just want to take a moment to honor them for uh, their generosity and support. And we have uh, Union Theological Seminaries, Chicago Theological Seminary, Wake Forest Divinity School, the First Amendment Museum which you'll hear more from today, Interfaith Alliance, the National Council of Jewish Women, Shoulder to Shoulder, Wesley Theological Seminary, the Open Church of Maryland, Union Presbyterian Seminary, Star King School for the Ministry, the, racial, the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative at Vanderbilt Divinity School and Network Lobby. Thank you to all of you and to our individual donors that have supported us this week. Uh, we look forward to continuing our partnerships with you. So this morning is about mobilizing and taking action. We have talked all week about the ways in which Christian nationalism has showed up in the public square. And it's not new. It's been happening for a very long time, but we're seeing it more and more in terms of voter suppression. We're seeing it in terms of the reversal of Roe versus Wade decisions and the right that women, the rights that women have um, to make decisions about their bodies and body autonomy and health care, because it's health care. Um, at the same time, we've also talked about the issues that impact uh, the LGBTQIA community and religious and non-religious communities. And so today, we're here to develop the skills, enhance our skills and take an action, especially when we think about um, that in less than two weeks is the midterm elections across this country. And so many people have fought to advance right. and to 
have their rights to vote in this country. And it's important that we protect that. It's important that we are civically engaged and doing the work. And as you'll hear later on from the First Amendment Museum, that we're really able to fully live our freedoms. What does that mean to be able to live our freedoms? And so we're delighted to have with us this morning, Andrea Miller with the Center for Common Ground and Maxwell Nobish with the First Amendment Museum. So we're going to start with uh, introducing Ms. Miller, who is a founder, board member, and executive director for the Center for Common Ground. She's also um, involved with People for Demand and Action and the president of the National Women's Political Caucus of Virginia and a member of the Democracy and Governance Working Group of the Virginia Green New Deal. Andrea is an IT and political director, a digital and, and election strategist. She designs and administers digital phone banks and texting, pro, um, texting programs. From 2013 to 2015, she led the Progressive Roundtable on Capitol Hill, bringing together members of Congress, activists, and nonprofit leaders. Her expertise is in voting rights, climate justice, and and the Equal Rights Amendment. She has successfully advocated for legislation on both the federal and state levels. In 2018, she was the Democratic nominee for the Virginia 4th Congressional District. In other words, Ms. Andre is a bad woman. <laughs> that she has taken time out of her very busy schedule during this election season and this Saturday morning to be with us and to provide resources and information to help train us. So I want to welcome to uh, the screen, Ms. Andrea Miller. Thank you, Ms. Andrea, for joining us. <laughs> hello, hello. So delighted to be here. And my favorite course really to present is how to be an effective citizen advocate lobbyist whatever you want to call it and what I did today was I customized the course so that it really does a little bit of messaging on voting rights. So Sabrina, I loved the use of the word freedom in the title of this series. I love your use of the word freedom because Freedom is a very, very important word in the American psyche. Freedom and being free people is who we like to think we are. We aren't really, but if we were living our dream and our fantasy, we would be. So today, I'm going to be talking about how and what we can do to move ourselves to where we know we really and truly want to be. We're just unfortunately not there yet. So what I'm gonna do is uh, we're gonna be walking through how to lobby on federal voting rights. And technically, once you start talking about lobbying, doing advocacy, federal, state, local, it's pretty much all the same. We're going to be looking at some messaging on voting. We're going to be looking at what it's going to take to get us up to and through lobbying meetings. We'll look at a couple of online research tools. And if we have time, we'll talk about advocacy tools. Now, number one, when you personally or your organization is planning on putting together a lobbying campaign, number one, you have to have a goal. The old teach and chong, how can you know when you get there if you don't know where you're going, is really, really true with advocacy and lobbying. What 
is it that you're trying to achieve? And then do we have the right target? Who can give us what we want? Now, 99% of the time, my lobbying campaigns have been directed at elected officials, either at the federal level or the state. Every once in a while, we would do a corporate lobbying campaign where we were lobbying a corporation. Normally, it was to get them to stop doing a very bad thing, but occasionally we got to do a really fun one where we wanted them to do something good. Now, tactics. What can you do to influence this person slash group of people? And then your research. Are there upcoming deadlines where we're going to need to get things done before the deadlines? Do we know the personal stance of the elected people on past legislation? And most importantly, who is the opposition? I had a friend lose a lobbying campaign in the state of New York because they forgot to look at who is the opposition and they did not take the proper steps to neutralize the opposition's influence. Now, um, we're going to just start really quickly because everybody who is um, involved in this will be aware of some messaging that we've seen on voting. We remember the term freedom to vote. People wanted us to pass for the people act. Um, and then we all remember the signs, let my people vote. When we talk about freedoms, that suddenly moves voting rights out of the realm purely of the left and progressives into the middle. And we can even get momentary attention at least to people who are on that more conservative side because we said the word freedom. Now, messaging on voting, um, we want to make sure that we include everybody when they're voting, hence our language, freedom to vote. Now, Everybody heard about two pieces of legislation, the For the People Act, which was designed to set basic ground rules on what voting had to look like in all 50 states. What some people didn't realize is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is really just a reauthorization. And it is an expansion of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, but those two bills, while they're really going to help a lot, they're not really the be all end all. We are going to need to do some other things, but I digress. Let's move on to lobbying. What we are going to need to do when we get into the 118th Congress, when we look at what is happening in our state houses to achieve that freedom to vote that we know we need. Now, number one, what the heck is lobbying? Well, you are lobbying. It's really, really simple. When you are seeking to influence, you're trying to persuade, you're bringing pressure to bear. And the last point, even though I put it as the last point, is probably the most important point about lobbying. It's consistent and it's persistent. Now, I always ask people when I would do these classes in person, 
school or the most effective lobbyist. And sometimes I would try to make it a little easier and I would go, that you ever met. And people would go, oh, okay. I I, I don't know people from the big DC law firm so that I ever met. The most effective lobbyist you have ever met are children. Um, and then the follow-up question was, have you ever told a child no? that they weren't going to be able to do something or get something. And then eventually you gave in. You gave in because they were consistent and they were persistent. Their ask was always the same. They were always trying to persuade you. They sold you on the benefits and they continuously brought pressure and they eventually wore you down. So that is what lobbying really is. And that is effective lobbying. Now, why do we do it? Well, number one, it is our responsibility as citizens. And if we, the people, want to really have a say in our voice, as opposed to we, the corporations, then we are going to have to match their lobbying consistency, only we're going to need to bring our voice and our message to, number one, the halls of Congress at, well, number one, halls of Congress, and number two, our own state houses. And sometimes that might actually start at a city council. Now, there are over 30,000 paid lobbyists in D.C., Lobbying is a multi-billion dollar business in the United States. We are talking about being citizen lobbyists. And we want to be citizen lobbyists because we the people know why a bill, a rule, a law is important to us. And I always tell people, when you look at elected officials, most of them are not attorneys or legal experts. When you really go down and dig in their bio, what were you before you got into elected office? They were regular people like you and me. They were teachers, they were doctors, they were dentists, they were social workers. Um, and sometimes they were business owners. They just had a good skill at raising money and were able to inspire people to follow them. Obviously, lobbying works. Otherwise, corporations wouldn't invest billions of dollars a year in doing it. So again, it's our responsibility to put forth our agenda because corporations are not going to do it. They've got their own agenda. Now, what's an effective lobbying campaign? Number one, it is ongoing. You don't show up one day a year, you're done, and now there's not going to be anything else. No, no, no. There, 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 there needs to be more to it than that. It's ongoing. It's got a series of planned actions, all coordinated to get the desired effect. It needs to be carefully planned, carefully researched, and carefully executed. I like to think of lobbying as a campaign. And when we think of a campaign, our mind immediately goes to a campaign has a plan, it has a goal. And then when we achieve our goal, we won. Sometimes when we say the word lobbying, we're not sure where we're going with it. Well, we are beginning a campaign that we are going to carefully plan, research, and execute. And at the end of the campaign, we win, not the big corporations. Now, lobbying, it is both an art and a science. Now, 
effective lobbying, what are we trying to do? People who are in elected office basically do one thing. All right, I'm going to say they do two. They can, I'm going to expand it to three. They can introduce legislation. They can co-sponsor legislation or and or they can vote on legislation. Be my initial sponsor, introduce my bill, co-sponsor a bill that's already introduced. When this bill comes up for a vote, I need you to vote yes. Sometimes it's no, but whatever winning looks like to you. Effective lobbying, very simply, turns no into maybe, turns maybe into yes, turns yes into can I help build support? Most people kind of get the no into maybe and the maybe in the yes, where most organizations fall down is they think once they get the yes, they're done. No, 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 no. There is a second step, no matter what it is that they answer. You're always trying to move the people with the power to get you what you want. You're always trying to move them forward. Now, we get a lot of questions on this. Who can lobby? Well, number one, you're a citizen, um, or you are an interested party, even if you are not a citizen. You contact those in elected office with fellow citizens, and you let them know what is important to you. Now, if your organization and people demanding action is a 501c4, there is an unlimited amount of lobbying that we can do on the issues that are important to us. Here's the big one for organizations like ours that are C3s. Church is a regular C3 nonprofit. And this is from the Internal Revenue Service. Organizations that are 501c3 are limited to 20% of their annual budget. That is what they can spend on lobbying. Now, one of the things that I was semi-famous for, and I taught a lot of people to do it, is I call it the 30-second pitch. Some people call it the elevator pitch. Whenever you find yourself in front of a legislator, have that 30-second pitch ready. So if you're going to go to D.C. or you're going to go to your state capital, have your 30-second pitch ready so that in the event you encounter a legislator, and again, what are the odds that you're going to run into a legislator when you're walking through the halls of Congress or you're walking through the odds of your state house? They're actually pretty darn high. So be prepared, be ready to make your ask. Now, again, they can co-sponsor, they can vote, or either you need new legislation. So you know your name, there's a bill number, a bill name, or there's what you would like the bill to do and you've made up your own name, what it does and why they should support it. Now, remember, the number one rule is sales. People do things for their reasons, not yours. So what is that legislator going to get? Generally, it needs to be money or votes. Well, we're not in the we're going to get you money business, but we are in the if this is something that's very, very popular and there are other constituents are going to like it, then hmm, this could be very popular with the folks back home. Uh, later on, if you want, I will do a 30 second pitch. I'll just have to decide what I'm going to do it on. All right. That was the kind of the art part of lobbying. That was the fun part. Now, this is 
the work work part, the science. Bill's legislation had six different stages and every stage has different targets and a different timeline. Stage one, looking for a bill sponsor. Most of the time at the federal level and even at the state level, that's already been done. You had somebody to introduce the bill. I normally am one of those people who goes on the hill to find that initial bill sponsor, the person who will bring the bill. Step two or stage two. Now we've got to get more co-sponsors on the bill. And the initial co-sponsors are going to be the legislator where when the bill is introduced, it will be legislator A along with legislators B, C, D, E, F, G are introducing a bill to do da da. Then after the bill is introduced, you are going to keep on building and getting co-sponsors with the goal of having that bill get a committee hearing and then having a vote. Now, when you introduce a bill, normally it is reasonably quickly at the federal level assigned to at least one committee. Often it will be multiple committees. At the state level, frequently it will just be initially one committee and it may not be that immediate. Now, once your bill is assigned to a committee, now you are going to look at all the members on that committee and go, all right, who is going to be a yes vote to get that bill out of committee? Because once we get the bill out of the committee, now we probably have a chance of getting that bill to the floor, where normally there's going to be hearings, people who supported, people who are against it, and then the entire legislative chamber, House or Senate, is going to vote on it. And then if we successfully get the bill through one chamber, now we're so lucky, it's going to cross over to the other chamber and we kind of sort of get to start all over again. Now, what I normally do is, I normally like to have parallel bills. I like to have the bill in both chambers, and then I'm building close answers on the Senate side and the House side, so that once I get it through either Chamber A or Chamber B, I've already laid the groundwork for that final chamber. And then once you get it through those chambers, it's a very, very special stage. Now it's got to go to the executive president, governor, for we're going to sign this baby into law. Uh, I'm going to go through the bill sponsor fairly quickly because normally most people don't need to do this. But what you always want to do, even if you're just looking for co-sponsors, is you're going to really want to concentrate on items two, three, and four. You've got a bill you think this is a very good bill. We like this bill. As people of faith, this is a good bill. So how many organizations currently support this bill? In other words, how many organizations actually know this bill exists? Now, are there other faith groups that support the bill? Having faith groups support a piece of legislation is beyond huge because once a faith organization supports a bill, legislators immediately start thinking, how many people are in that church know about that bill? So this is now no longer 
one person. This is now hundreds, thousands, other tens of thousands of people who are supporting that bill and how many of them are in my district. And then the other thing, what other groups are willing to help you build co-sponsors? As faith organizations, the names of our organizations are magic in terms of getting meetings with legislative offices. They just are. I work on many pieces of legislation as our organization, People Demanding Action. But when I was working in coalitions and the faith organizations were in the lead, we could get meetings so easily with offices that had turned us down when we were approaching as secular organizations. So we've got our groups together, we've got our coalition, and now we're looking for who is our bill champion. So if we've got to introduce a new bill, if we don't have a choice and there's only one person willing to introduce it, okay, yes, we have to go with that. But if we have the luxury of choice, this is what you're looking for. Now, your bill champion, are they willing to help promote the bill? Will they promote the bill to their colleagues with a dear colleague letter or something like that? Do they work on both sides of the aisle? So if they're a Democrat, do they work with Republicans and vice versa? Independents are right in the middle. That doesn't exactly count as the other side. They're kind of the other, they're kind of the other piece of both sides. So since we tend in the US to purely be a two-party system, is this a legislator that can talk with and work with people on the other side? And now here's the biggie. Are they on a committee that can send the bill to the floor? So if your initial sponsor, your champion is on the committee of jurisdiction is what that's called. That is a win, a win, and another win. Just all in one person. So um, just some more information. Lead sponsors generally write a dear colleague letter and really great lead sponsors when the legislators are standing in line waiting to give testimony for or against a bill, they will chat up the other members about the importance of this bill. So again, remember, elected folks are members of a very exclusive club. And no matter how much they like you, you are still outside that club until you get elected. So if you can get a fellow elected to speak to one of their fellow members, that is really, really powerful. Building initial co sponsors. Somebody in an organization somewhere needs to be doing this research. All right, now, when we get this bill introduced, who should be the initial people who bring the bill out with the lead sponsor? So that means you're gonna do some legislative research. Is there a bill 
from a previous session that either was identical to this one or very similar. If so, who are all the people that were on that bill? Those are your first targets for being the initial co-sponsors for the new bill in the new legislative session. Now, right now in Congress, we are in 117th Congress. On January 3rd or 4th, the 118th Congress will be seated and all bills will start with number one. So that means when we are helping legislators build co-sponsors, we're going to go back and look at, all right, who are all the people that sponsored this legislation in the previous Congress in the 117th? Were there any in the 116th that for whatever reason didn't go on in the previous session? That is your master list. That's who you go and speak with. Once you have the draft of that bill, now you're going to use that to build support. At the federal level, a bill is considered moving. Once it reaches 100 co-sponsors in the House, because remember there's 400 and 85 House members. And once you have 20 senators, there's 100 senators. That bill is considered moving. And again, the co-sponsor milestone. Now, in many instances, if a bill is bipartisan, meaning there's Dems and Republicans on it, it can be considered moving even if the numbers aren't quite at 120. At the state level, they don't tend to run co-sponsors the way they do at the federal level, generally because very few state legislatures are year round. Most state legislatures go into session anywhere from 60 to 120 days. So if you get a bill and it's bipartisan, you are doing very, 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 very well. All right. So you've got the bill. It's got its initial list of co-sponsors. And you're going to keep adding co-sponsors so that when the bill gets a committee hearing, hopefully the bill will be voted out of committee. So now after you've gotten your initial co-sponsors, you're going through that list, who's on the committee. And now they become the primary target to add them on as co-sponsors because they're going to have first opportunity to vote for this piece of legislation. Now, if your champion's party is in the majority, they may use a committee hearing to build support among other legislators. So you want to be close to your bill champion because they will let you know there's going to be a hearing on this bill on this date and this time. Can you get supporters to come and speak in favor of this bill? Now, this is where it becomes very important to know your opposition. Who are they? And what are their talking points? Because you are going to want to be prepared to counter their talking points. So I put down at the bottom, know who is for you, who is against you, and who is on the fence. Lobbying in many ways is kind of like an election. The only thing is there's no fixed date in stone when it's going to happen. Now, stage five, the floor vote. Probably 20% of the legislation introduced in Congress actually makes it to the floor. 
probably 35 to 50 percent of the legislation introduced in various state houses make it to the floor. Every member of the legislative chamber is entitled to vote during the floor vote. So you are going to want to, before that floor vote, thank all the legislators who voted for your bill in committee. Now, in the committee hearing, you will have heard the talking points of your opposition. This may give you the opportunity to counter that and we approach legislators who were not supportive because now you've got a counter to all these positions. Now, welcome to the world of politics. Is leadership for or against you? What leadership? The leadership of the two political parties and the leadership of that particular chamber. Every chamber, Senate, House, has whips. Are the whips for or against you? If leadership is for you, they will activate the whips and tell the whips to help you build up support. If leadership is against you, they may activate the whips and tell the whips not to support your bill. So again, the whips, you have them at the state house, you have them in Congress, and it is their job to whip up support for or against a bill. Now, crossover. You had the vote, and unless it's something really unusual, constitutional amendments in many states, you have the required number of votes to pass the bill out of that chamber. Now it's going to cross over and go to the other part of the bicameral chamber, all right? And so everything that you did to get the bill through the first chamber, now you get to do it all over again. And now you're thinking, where is the executive on this? The president or the governor, um, if they are opposed and they veto your bill, what are you going to need to do in other words, how many votes are you going to need to override that veto? So again, this is the science of lobbying, all right? Now, we're going to step back and we're going to look at actually going into the individual offices and lobbying. Show numbers in the field. Visit your offices with groups of three to five. 25 people is not a lobby group, it's a mob. Three to five people is a lobby group. So you're going to want to split your mob up into several groups. Try to make sure you have at least one constituent of the legislature, and you're going to want to have one expert in the field. Now, when I would go to Capitol Hill, we would normally visit 70 offices on a bad day, 140 offices on a good day. We did not make appointments. We just barged in. Um, most organizations prefer to try to make an appointment. Um, you're going to ask to meet the legislature. Normally, you're going to meet with staff. And... Nowadays, a lot of these meetings are in Zoom rather than in parts, and, and you're going to want to be able to explain to them there is a broad base of support. So I mentioned three to five people is ideal. Try to have a diverse constituency in terms of race, age, and gender. Be respectful, be early look presentable. Um, I remember once doing a lobby day on Capitol Hill and a young man had actually flown in 
from another state and they lost his luggage. And he was going to be going on a lobby visit wearing cargo shorts and a t-shirt. He knew a lot about the legislation, so we went along. Now, you're going to want to have a facilitator who's going to run the meeting, storytellers. Hopefully, these are constituents who can say how this bill will positively impact them. You need the asker, somebody after the storytellers and the educator have presented facts and the stories to say, well, will Senator so-and-so support this bill? And then shut up and wait for the answer. You're also going to bring the secretary to collect all the business cards. Now, when you're going to the office, know where you're going. So you're going to want to have the building on Capitol Hill. There are three buildings for the House, three buildings for the Senate. Know the building and the office number where people are. There are free apps. Um, Congress only works on Android, but Track Bill and Bill Track 50 work on Android and iOS. And they will both give you the legislator and they'll give you his office. Now, you're in the meeting, you're meeting, and this would be a reasonable meeting. So your introductions, two minutes, names and city, why you're here, two minutes, story time, two to three minutes from each person. And we don't want 10 minute and 20 minute stories. Yes, yes, the straightforward one minute is a long time. There may be questions that could be three to five minutes, at which point when you're done with questions, make the ask again, and then thank you. Now, engage the staffers, pause after each main point, ask if they have questions, if the bill you're lobbying on is complex or controversial, go back and restate your points. Think of this as educate Congress or educate your state legislature, your teaching. I already went through the effective ask. Straight to the point, ask the question, be silent and wait for the answer. In sales, when you do the closing ask, he who speaks first loses. So you're going to ask the question, looking them straight in the eye, and you're going to wait for an answer. Now, can a staffer commit their elected legislature to a response? No. But what they can say is, well, the legislator, Senator so-and-so, has previously sponsored legislation like this. And you're thinking, yes, that's why we're here. Or they can say, uh, I don't know about this. But you do want to know where they are so that you can ask these follow-up questions. If this is something they've supported in the past, who else should you go and see? And can you tell them that their office sent you? Um, what is the opposition? Have you seen people coming in speaking against the bill? Oh, well, a Heritage Foundation was in here last week. That's what you need to know. And then if they say no, what's it going to take to get you on board? Now, do not ever walk into a legislative office asking a legislator to support a bill and you did not bring a handout. That's like going and doing a lit drop for a political campaign and not having any literature. You weren't there. So your handout should be one page. You can fudge it one page printed front and back. Anything longer than one page, do you really think they're going to read it? No, your talking points should be bullet points. It should not be a front page and a back page filled with paragraphs. It should be as voters in your dist district, this is what you get. Um, and then this is why you should support the bill 
bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, uh, ask them again to support the bill, thank them for their time. And then follow up. People really fall down on this one. Thank the legislator. No, the note does not need to be handwritten in this day and age. And email will do very, very nicely. Um, keep building support, stay in touch, keep the relationship alive and always try and find common ground. And then I've got the thank you letter. When you have a lot of groups, you can do things like have rallies in front of their office. We've been away from that in the era of the pandemic. Letters, petitions, calls, all those things help show support. Did you know? 10 phone calls, 10 emails on a particular bill get the attention of staffers and members of Congress in a state legislature three. I'm going to skip the street lobby. You're going to get this. And I want to show you one piece of the legislative tracker that I use. Bill Track 50. Now, Bill Track 50, one of the things you can do is you can look up legislators and it will show you what they voted for. It will also show you what committees they're on. And for someone like me, very, very importantly, it gives me staff first. All right, I'm gonna stop now. We've got a couple minutes and I will be happy to quickly entertain questions. Oh, okay. I see uh, there's a question. A freedom of petition, underrated and overlooked freedom. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, I love that most effective lobbyists are children. Uh, what is John Lewis? Voting Rights Act and what does it entail? Is it going to pass? It did not pass. It passed the U.S. House. The filibuster in the Senate prevented it from passing. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is simply the reauthorization of the 1965 Civil Rights Act. When that bill was signed into law in 1965, it was a bill that had a reauthorization clause. Constitutional amendments tend to be forever unless a new amendment basically makes it moot. Legislation can be designed to basically be ongoing or it can be designed to require reauthorization. The 1965 Voting Rights Act requires reauthorization, and it was not reauthorized on the last reauthorization session. Ms. Andre, Anything else? Yes, Ms. Andre, I'm, I'm glad that you made that point about um, pieces of legislation that have to be reauthorized and some that are ongoing, because I think a lot of times um, citizens and everyday people don't understand why bills, and I know before I got into advocacy work, I didn't understand that bills have to be reintroduced every year if they haven't been passed before. So right. when people sometimes uh, hear about a piece of legislation, and then the next year is like, okay, we're working to push this forward. They're like, wait a minute. Then they do that last year. Well, if it didn't pass, you have to keep working on. Have to do it all over these. again. Yes, uh, that. So I appreciate you sharing that point. There was also a question that came up in the chat um, that was sent directly to me, um, and the question was. Um, what do you what do you do if you think your reps or legislatures are ignoring you and not listening to your attempts at lobbying? Uh, well, you number one, keep doing it. What do children do when they ask for something and you say no? Do they give up and quietly go away? I don't think so. They ramp up the pressure. 
Yes, they do. <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons why we're intentional about having these sessions is to really to help people um, get access to people like you and the tools and the resources, but also realize that one effort is not enough. Um, that we have to keep doing this work. Um, and, and I'm so grateful for people like you and other advocates and activists that and lobbyists that are on the Hill all the time pushing right. for the advancement of our rights. So yes, that, that, is, that is so critically um, important for us to think about as the rest of us sometimes just go about our daily lives, right? And not realizing really what's at stake, um, but someone's acting on our behalf as a liaison. And when um, I was on the Hill, we would normally go on the Hill with teams of anywhere from 10 to 20 people we also train people all over the country on the really salient points of legislation so that people could go and lobby in the home districts. That is really, really huge. So many legislators, and I'm going to say 80%, if not more, do not find people showing up at their district office lobbying on a piece of legislation. And so they're like, well, as long as the people at home don't know about it and they're the ones who vote for me, then I can ignore it. Yeah, it's Are there any other questions that anyone has at this point for um, Ms. Andrea? Um, and yes, Robin, I agree with you. That's why we're grateful <laughs> that we have access to people like Ms. Andrea and the Center for Common Ground because a lot of a lot of people don't know it is. It's a lot of work that's involved, and it's important. This is why we need to engage um, because advocates get tired too. We talked about that yesterday. Sometimes advocates do get tired and it's emotionally exhausting and mentally exhausting. But if it's your passion and your commitment, <laughs> then you, you find times to rest and you keep moving forward. Yeah. Any, so, any so sign those petitions and those direct email advocacy campaigns. Right. Now, paid lobbyists, um, in some ways, they are more effective because paid lobbyists are more consistent. If we had the consistency of the paid lobbyists, we would be just as effective, more effective. Paid lobbyists generally can't vote for the people they're lobbying. We, as people, friends with faith leaders, with congregations in many, many different cities and states, we have a direct line to the people who can't vote for them. That's why legislators really pay attention when a faith organization shows up or a faith organization is listed on that letter as a member of the coalition. And paid lobbyists do their research. As I said, I had a girlfriend, she had a great bill. The bill didn't even get introduced because she had not paid attention to who the opposition was. And the opposition wrote a letter to the legislator, told them not to introduce it, and the legislator didn't mm. know the opposition. That's really good. That's really great advice. Ms. Andrea, I cannot say thank you enough for being with us today and for really giving us the tools um, and information to help us to be better citizen lobbyists. 
Um, and I love that you framed it in that way, citizen lobbyists, that we need to recognize we all have a responsibility to do this work. Um, it takes yes. all of us. Um, and I think that's one of the things that has come up consistently during this conference. And we say consistently in our work, it takes all of us to do this. Um, and so thank you for the generosity of your wisdom, of your expertise, and, you know, we will continue to work together because I really believe in the work that you're doing because it supports the, the ability for us to live and thrive as human beings in society. And so, um, again, I want to encourage everyone that yeah, please join me and thank you, Ms. Um, Andrea. You can do virtual claps if you want to come off the screen, whatever. I see the comments are coming up in the chat. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And, um, and I encourage you, I'll put the um, link in the chat to visit the Center for Common Grounds website. There are always trainings. And here's the thing. This is not, um, it's not like I called Ms. Andrea and said, hey, can you do this? And I don't engage. I actually show up for her trainings. I actually make sure that I'm getting the tools that I need to be um, a more informed citizen and an active citizen in my community as well. So this is work that we take seriously um, at the center and and at, personally as an individual and as a mom. And so I just want to say thank you, Ms. Andrea, and we look forward to continuing to partner with you in other ways. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. What a great way to spend Saturday morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So now what we're going to do is we're going to transition because Ms. Andrea gave us the tools to be effective citizen lobbyists. And we want to um, spotlight one of our sponsors of this year's event. We, uh, we're very fortunate to have with us Maxwell Nashbish. Um, and Maxwell, I'm so sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, um, but we have Maxwell with us, who is the manager of visitor services at the First Amendment Museum. And I want to highlight um, Maxwell's uh, a very short bio, but tell you a little bit more about him. Maxwell is the manager of visitor services at the First Amendment Museum located in Augusta, Maine. The First Amendment Museum is a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to promoting the understanding of the use of the First Amendment to promote democracy so that all may reap the benefits. Um, it's important to know about Maxwell that in 2020, he published his thesis on spiritualism to free thought, free speech, and free investigation. The cultural landscape of Lilydale, New York, via the University of Georgia. In it, he underscores the history and the, the origins of spiritualism. He presents a case in the form of spiritualist of the spiritualist town of Lilydale, including an investigation of its status, relevance, and path in the context of religious research. And I want to add to that, that, you know, I'm so grateful that Maxwell and I have um, connected in January of this year. I was one of their speakers for, um, from the freedom of for the freedom of religion day and after that we continue to stay in touch and have conversations about the first amendment and the importance of protecting religious freedom for all and when i reached out about this conference they immediately said yes and to that i want to thank both maxwell and christian for the support of this religious freedom mobile institute and the work that you're doing at the first amendment museum and they are doing incredible programming, which I've also participated in that programming as well um, as a viewer. And so uh, with that, I want to bring Maxwell to the screen. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Can I share my screen? I just need permission to share and I'll share my PowerPoint. Absolutely. Um, so and yeah, and I always to anybody listening, um, I always uh, write really brief bios whenever I have to um, ask um, whenever someone asks me for a bio. So um, Sabrina found, it seems, I'm going to guess Sabrina found most of that online by Googling me. Is that true? Oh, 
We had we have our very uh, resourceful intern Katya who is okay, behind okay. the scenes. So, so just yes. a lesson to be careful what you put online because <laughs> people can find it when they Google you. Um, but yeah, I did write my uh, my master's thesis about um, the religion of spiritualism in the United States. So um, not really a direct um, relation to my job here at the First Amendment Museum. Um, I got hired here in 2020. Um, and so part of obviously what we do at the First Amendment Museum is we um, uh, talk about and educate uh, people on the freedom of religion. And so sort of that's what I want to do today is just um, kind of talk about a lot of the background and context and like important things to know about freedom of religion in the United States, because not only does I think that makes us stronger, I mean, it, you know, the cliche is knowledge is power. And so um, I hope some of the knowledge and some of the information that I uh, uh, present in this presentation um, is useful. Um, and it helps us become better uh, advocates of religious freedom um, in the United States. We're gonna be hitting like a wide variety of topics and different different things. Um, so I hope everyone finds something interesting in this. Uh, my voice, if I sound a little weird, is a little shot. It's field trip season here at the museum and I'm constantly trying to scream over middle schoolers and elementary schools and even high schoolers. So if I sound a little off or if I start coughing, um, I apologize. But that being said, um, First Amendment, freedom of religion stuff. Um, it's actually a very boring topic to me because I talk about it all the time. So if you guys have any questions while I go through, that would make it more interesting for me because I could talk about this stuff all day and it's like I barely have to think about it. So please ask questions. Um, um, and and I, ho I hope I'll have, the, I'll have a, a, some questions for you guys that will hopefully um, get anybody watching this sort of thinking. So uh, with that, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the First Amendment Museum, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit here in Augusta, Maine. A museum, we've been open since essentially 2016, but really just got going in 2020. Um, uh, I met Sabrina, like she said, in January of, oh my gosh, like 2020 this year. Yeah, things have been a blur since 2020. And so love the work that she does and the organization does. Glad to be here. Um, so what is the First Amendment? Um, that seems like an obvious question. But it's obviously one that I think a lot of people don't really like think about past like ninth grade uh, uh, civics or 10th grade government class. Uh, I went to public school in North Carolina and we everyone took civics and economics in 10th grade. And I think that's the last time anybody ever thought about the First Amendment. It was definitely the last time I had like really thought about the First Amendment since until I got this job here. So what is it? It's 45 words, it's a run-on sentence. If you're an English person, um, it's not the most uh, well-written sentence on planet Earth, but um, it, is, uh, it is a very important, impactful sentence. So what does it say? Um, it starts off with the first 16 words, the ones that are really important to what we're talking about today. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. First 16 words of these 45 words in the First Amendment, freedom of religion. We're going to break that down in a moment, but now that we have freedom of religion, we have or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So simply speaking, simply breaking that down to like it's bare bones and like essential what it's saying, it's essentially here in the United States, all American citizens are at least supposed to have freedom of religion, freedom of speech freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and freedom of petition. And where is the First Amendment? It's in the U.S. Constitution. And again, if you need a rehash on what the U.S. Constitution really is, it's very simple. It's just the rules and laws of our government. And the Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments. An amendment is a change or an addition to the Constitution. So we're talking about the first change, addition, or fix to the Constitution. The First Amendment that says we have these five freedoms. So why is the First Amendment in this order? Why does it start off with freedom of religion, then go to speech, press, assembly, and petition? In fact, a lot of people like are really confused. Um, when they come here for tours and I and I read them the First Amendment, I always stop and I and I go through each freedom and okay, well, what freedom was that? You know, I just read the first 16 words: Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What freedom is that? And they'll almost always go, freedom of speech. And it's no. 
freedom of religions first. And a lot of times people think the First Amendment is just the freedom of speech amendment. But no, it protects these five. And freedom of speech is just one of them. And freedom of speech is actually the second one. Freedom of rel uh, religion is the first one. And then I always ask people, well, why is freedom of religion the first one? Why would they put freedom of religion first? And usually I get something about like, oh, well, you know, the pilgrims, they came over here for religious freedom and blah, blah, blah. And that's a good guess. Um, but it's not exactly true, uh, like the correct answer. Um, the reason freedom of religion is number is the first freedom in the First Amendment is because what value is the freedom of speech if we don't have the freedom to think? And that's what freedom of religion is all about. It protects the right to think, it protects the right to philosophize, to moralize, to have a conscience, to where's your sense of right and wrong? What's your pursuit of happiness? What is your purpose here on planet Earth? What is your relationship with your fellow man? What's your relationship with the divine? All of these things are crucial to, un to having, you know, that moral code that guides what you think is right and wrong. And once you think what's right and wrong, now you can engage people. And I think this is bad. I think this is good. Um, so freedom of religion protects everything that I like to say goes on between in your, or in your uh, head or in your, if you want to get a little cheesy with it, in your heart. Um, protects everything that goes on within you. Um, and that's why it's the first freedom in the First Amendment, because it protects all those things you need to then tell those thoughts to others. So freedom of religion is first, because it protects your freedom to think, freedom of conscience. In fact, when the founding fathers during the um, Constitutional Convention were having their de debates and deliberations, a lot of them were actually using the term freedom of conscience instead of freedom of religion. And it was and in James Madison's original draft of the First Amendment. He used the term freedom of conscience instead of freedom of religion. But it wasn't until the last second that the Committee of Style for the Constitution changed that terminology to freedom of religion. So it kind of gives you an insight into how they're viewing it. So freedom of religion, freedom to think, freedom of speech, tell those thoughts to others, freedom of the press to get those thoughts out there to a wide audience all around the world. Freedom of assembly protects our right to get together to talk about those thoughts, to have our debates, to have our arguments, to our discussions, to form our political parties, uh, join political uh, labor unions have our parades, protests, all that stuff, really hash out our thoughts in the public sphere. And then once we've done that, we want to let the government know those thoughts. And that's where freedom of petition comes in. So it's not listed in order of importance. It describes a process, basically how we as citizens can change our government, change our society, and change our country. It's religion think, speech, tell those thoughts to others, press, get those out there, assembly, talk about those thoughts amongst ourselves, and petition, let the government know those thoughts. So breaking down, <laughs> excuse me, uh, the uh, freedom of religion, the first free, you know, the um, 16 words of the First Amendment that started off. Um, the first part of that is what we have. It's called the Establishment Clause, or excuse me, the Free Exercise Clause. So Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Sorry, I'm all over the place. This is the, um, the Free Exercise uh, Clause is the second part of this. So right after uh, the basically the term prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Um, and it was written, the first event was written by this guy, James Madison. So I have him saying it in a word bubble. And the free exercise clause, basically the part of this that says prohibiting the free exercise thereof means that we as American citizens have the free exercise of religion. We can practice whatever religion we want. The government cannot stop us. Government cannot stop us from going to church. Government cannot force us to go to church. Uh, we can stay at home on Sundays. We can spend all day in church. We can do whatever we want. We have the free exercise of religion. You can be a Hindu, Muslim, a Jewish person, a Christian, atheist, agnostic, Orthodox, Hindu, Buddhist, <laughs> you name it. You have the free exercise of religion in the U.S. Um, and I have this quote from a former uh, Supreme Court justice to sort of put it in better terms than I can. He says, the free exercise clause protects the individual from any coercive measure that encourages him towards one faith or creed, discourages him from another, or makes it prudent or desirable for him to select one and embrace it. So basically it empowers us as citizens to pick our religious beliefs. Um, we have the freedom to believe whatever we want, but we do not have the freedom to do whatever we want and say it is freedom of religion. Um, you know, for an extreme example that I think really drives home the message, I can't do a human sacrifice every week and say it's my freedom of religion. So it's not murder because it's religious freedom. And this rule comes from this Supreme Court case right here. Um, it's actually the first Supreme Court case that dealt with freedom of religion. It's from 1877. 
It's called Reynolds v. United States. Um, this is Mr. Reynolds on the left or on my left. Um, and these are his three wives. And so he said that it was his religious freedom to have as many wives as he want, wanted. He could be in a polygamous relationship. He was a Latter-day Saint, a Mormon. And he said it was part of his religious beliefs that he could have as many lives as possible, or wives as possible. Um, the state of Utah, where he was living, defined marriage as between two people and two people only. So he went to court and said that was a violation of freedom of religion. And the court sided with the state of Utah and said, no, no, no. Free exercise clause of the First Amendment says you can believe whatever you want. You can believe that polygamy is correct, but you cannot do whatever you want. You cannot get have a polygamous relationship. So uh, poor Mr. Reynolds couldn't have his three wives. So again, the free exercise clause of the First Amendment protects the right to hold any religious belief, but not to the right to engage in any religious activity whatsoever. On um, the Establishment Clause, and I kind of got these out of order making this PowerPoint, so I apologize about that. Um, but it really starts with the Establishment Clause, which Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So that's basically saying the United States government cannot have a national religion. We cannot have, we cannot declare ourselves a Christian nation or any other religion nation. Um, the United States government cannot create its own religion and say, you know, we're, this is now the religion of America and we all have to worship it, um, that there is no established religion in the United States. And this was re 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 uh, really revolutionary in the time. Um, you know, if you think about the world in 1791, you're living in a world of like divine kings and queens. I mean, Japan, China, Russia, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, places all around the world um, are have these the system of government where it's usually an authoritarian, a king or a queen, who claims they are uh, divinely ordained um, and they control the state church. So if you think of Russia, you think of the czar of Russia, who is the leader of the Orthodox Church. And the Orthodox Church is the religion in Russia. And if you disagree, head goes off, you're out of here. Uh, France, we have the king, you know, King Louis, all those people that do get their heads chopped off. They're uh, Catholics, right? Catholic monarchy. And you got to be Catholic in France or you're in big trouble. Spain, same thing, Catholic. Uh, Britain, you have the Anglican church, Protestants. Um, you're Protestant and blah, blah, blah. And these people are fighting about this all throughout the centuries, right? They're always going to war with each other over religion. So in the United States, we said, you know what? We don't want this. We don't want an established church. There's going to be no state church. So no. So we have this thing called the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment. But if you're a lawyer, you, uh, you pay attention to the wording of things. It says, we shall have no law respecting establishment of religion. Well, this is a former Supreme Court Justice, Anton Scalia. You guys may remember him. Um, very conservative man. <laughs> I see Andrea um, nodding with her eyes. <laughs> um, um, he said, ha, ha, ha. Whatever the establishment clause means, it does not mean the government cannot accommodate uh, religion or indeed favor religion. So we can't have an established religion. First Amendment says that. But can we have a favorite religion? Is that different? Is there, is there a little bit of a difference there between establishing something, having a favorite? Antonin Scalia would say, yeah, there is a difference. And we can have a favorite religion, a favored religion in the United States. Now, obviously, not everyone agrees with Mr. Antonin Scalia. Um, but uh, my point is, is like this, this is kind of like what lawyers and judges do, right? They look at the law and go, hmm. It's a nice 45 words. Um, doesn't say this, doesn't say that, doesn't say this. So can I do this, this, this? And again, this is why we have courts to answer these questions. Um, so why is freedom of religion important? Just beyond the legal side of the First Amendment and what the First Amendment says, why is freedom of religion important? Why do we even care? Because again, it protects your right to believe, think, imagine, philosophize, moralize, right? Uh, it all these things that go on within us. Uh, again, freedom of conscience. Freedom to think and believe and dream, all that stuff. And it also keeps the, the free, uh, First Amendment keeps government out of religion. Um, now, it, a lot of people will say it doesn't keep religion out of the government, but it keeps the government out of religion, or at least it tries to, but it's obviously a lot more nuanced than that. So let's look at some history and law. So when we started as a country, um, by whatever, 18th century standards, pretty religious diverse, not by like modern standards, but by back then, sure, you had the Puritans in New England, you had the Methodist all around, 
Um, you had the Quakers in places like Pennsylvania, you know, like William Penn. Um, you had the Anglican Church, especially down south, South Carolina, uh, North Carolina. Um, you had Islam. This surprises a lot of people. Um, this is a, a picture of a pew on the bottom left here from, I think it's First African Baptist in Savannah, Georgia. Um, I, I, it's been a while since I've been there, but they have Islamic script on the pews. So basically, um, the enslaved people that were brought over, brought over with them Islam. And you know, a lot of them did it, had to do it in secret. Um, but this is sort of a legacy of that, that someone remembered this Islamic script and knew, okay, it's holy, and wrote it on the drew it on the pews to decorate this church. That's I think it's the oldest African church in um in Savannah. Um and if you've ever seen the 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 you know roots, Alex Haley's roots, you know, he found out that his ancestors were um Muslim. So you have Islam, uh, you have Catholics. Um, you know, Maryland is the Catholic colony. You have Judaism. This is a picture of the oldest, um, well, it's the, it's, it's the oldest Jewish congregation in the United States, New York City. Obviously, this building is not the oldest Jewish synagogue in the United States, but it is the current building of the oldest Jewish congregation. The oldest Jewish synagogue in the United States is in Rhode Island. We'll talk about why. Um, and everything was peace and love, right? All the religions got um, got along and everybody was happy and uh, everything was great, right? Obviously, no no need for any religious strife, nothing. No, obviously things were not like that. Things were awful. Um, in Massachusetts, uh, New England, you could not be a Quaker. If you were a Quaker, they'd execute you. They executed Quakers. Uh, you couldn't be a Catholic, they execute you. Obviously you couldn't be a witch. I mean, we're talking about Salem witch trial era, right? So you couldn't do that. Um, you had Catholics and Protestants fighting each other in Maryland. In fact, the only battle of the English Civil War that happened in North America was in Maryland between Catholics and Protestants, who literally formed battle lines and went and you know old timey shot each other. Um, uh, again, more you know religious dissenters, especially in New England. Um, the enslaved people, their religious freedom was not honored and respected, obviously. Um, uh, Methodists and Baptists and the Anglicans fighting each other in Virginia. James Madison, the author of the First Amendment, like was an eyewitness to a lot of this. And he was like, what the heck is going on? I mean, you would have this picture as a Baptist minister, a bunch of Baptists riding into towns and they're like getting beaten up and stuff and, and tortured by the, the locals in the area who don't like them. I um, mean, of course, Native American religion, <clears throat> excuse me, was not respected. Obviously not, no. Um, and then in Florida, you have the Spanish. They're Catholics. They don't want any Protestants coming into their land and coming into their territory. So you can't be Protestant and come to Florida. So we have a lot of religious strife, anger, resentment, you know, uh, uh, tension, all that stuff. Um, there was one place that was sort of the exception. That was Rhode Island. Um, Rhode Island was the only was the first colony to establish total religious freedom. Um, and the reason why is because it was founded by religious dissenters. Um, these two, Anne Hutchinson and Roger, uh, Roger Williams, were religious dissenters who founded Rhode Island. And they said, you know what, we're going to have religious freedom here. And so in their colonial charter, they said no person residing in Rhode Island could be molested, punished, disquieted, or called into question of, for any differences in opinion in matters of religion. So maybe not the most eloquent phrasing, but basically freedom of religion. Um, and colonial and uh, Rhode Island's colonial uh, charter was so strong and um, so, uh, I guess, well liked in Rhode Island that um, it lasted up until like the mid 19th century. So I think Rhode Island's colonial charter like lasted longer than Rhode Island's current constitution as of so far. So kind of a testament to that document. But again, freedom of religion is in Rhode Island. And then we get the First Amendment, 1791. Then Mr. James Madison, the author, he sees this stuff going on and he goes, okay, we, we, we can't do this. Like, we can't keep doing this. We can't keep killing each other over this stuff and like fighting. We're never, we just have to say everyone has religious freedom. So first amendment comes around. But when the first amendment was written, it only applied to the national government. If you read the first five words of the first amendment it says Congress shall make no law. So back then it only applied to the federal government. It did not apply to state governments. So states in their state constitutions could still have established churches. Virginia got rid of its established religion with the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, written by Thomas Jefferson, and the statute dis uh, disestablished the Church of England and Virginia and guaranteed freedom of religion of people of all faiths in that state. 
because they had to do it uh, state by state. And Thomas Jefferson on his grave, he has like the three biggest things he's proud of in his life. And this is one of them. Um, he was a big advocate of freedom of religion. Um, if you've ever heard of the Jefferson Bible, um, basically Thomas Jefferson took a copy of the New Testament and cut out, like literally cut out with scissors, all the parts of so showing Jesus's supernatural abilities or miracles. So he was like, I'm interested in the philosophy of Jesus, but I don't believe in this uh, miracle magic stuff. And so it's a, it's a pretty controversial book, like the Jefferson Bible, like a lot of frankly, like evangelicals, like don't like to admit the fact that it exists because it shows a sort of doubt in the divine that Thomas Jefferson had. Um, so in Massachusetts was the last state to uh, disestablish their religion. Um, and I can call them mass souls. I'm sorry if that offends anybody. I'm from Maine and Maine has a hang up about uh, Massachusetts. Just kidding. I, I do love Massachusetts. But Massachusetts was bad in the, in the fact that they were the last state to disestablish their church. Um, congregationalism was their state church until 1833. Um, that's like 50 years after the First Amendment. So that they had a state established church until 1833. Um, but you'll also notice what's lacking. Where's that separation of church and state? Um, a lot of people will say that's in the Constitution. You won't find that term in the Constitution. You can Google the Constitution, read it. You won't find the term separation of church and state. So it's not in the Constitution. But where does that term come from? Um, it was popularized. Thomas Jefferson did not really in, say the term, the term originally, but he popularized the term um, in a letter to the Danbury Baptists. The Danbury Baptists were a group of Baptists in Connecticut who were like kind of doubtful of this whole religious freedom thing. And this was not like unique to the Danbury Baptists. Again, this whole freedom of religion thing was like really new and people were like, is this true? Are you actually gonna do this? Is this actually gonna happen? Uh, George Washington wrote a famous letter that was similar to this letter to Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and again, with the oldest synagogues in Rhode Island because of that religious freedom. Um, and the people in Toro Synagogue basically wrote to George Washington saying, are you seriously not gonna like persecute Jewish people? Are you actually not going to? And George Washington wrote this like eloquent, like freedom of religion is so important, blah, 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 blah. And so we have a similar letter to Thomas Jefferson a couple years later from the Danbury Baptist. They're saying, well, is this freedom of religion stuff gonna happen? And Thomas Jefferson resp uh, responds, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declare that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So he's quoting the first amendment, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. So Thomas Jefferson interprets the First Amendment as meaning it builds a wall between separation of church and state. And so this letter is published. Um, it establishes, it popularizes this concept of the separation of church and state here in the United States. Um, a, a big advocate of the separation of church and state was this man, um, James G. Blaine. Uh, unless you're a really, 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 really hardcore US history nut, you have probably never heard of James G. Blaine. Um, James G. Blaine was a member of the Senate and House of Representatives back in the 19th century from Maine. In fact, the governor's mansion here in Maine is called the Blaine House, named after him. It's a little ironic because he was never governor, but it's named after him. Um, and he was a fervent advocate of the separation of church and state. And in 1876, while serving the House of Representatives, he proposed a constitutional amendment that would explicitly prevent states' use of public funds to support religious institutions. Basically, he, <clears throat> he wanted to put separation of church and state in the Constitution via an amendment. James G. Blaine was such a strong advocate of separation of church and state that he wanted that term in the Constitution. And amazingly, it did pass the House. And this was all the way back in 1876. I don't know if a separation of church and state amendment would even be brought up in the house in 2022. Uh, again, we sort of have this view of the past as a very religious er place, and that's true to a certain degree, um, but there was also a lot more secularism and frankly atheism in the past than we like kind of imagine the past. Um, and so it passed the house, but it failed in the Senate. Um, and, and, and why was he a big advocate of separation of church and state? I think most people, I'm gonna assume most people on this call, uh, probably like the idea of separation of church and state. 
But James G. Blaine liked the idea because he was nervous about the Catholic influence on the United States. So short, sort of complicating the historical narrative here, James G. Blaine is kind of a bigot. Um, he doesn't like Irish immigrants. He doesn't like uh, immigrants from Germany. Um, these They're bringing Catholicism. He thinks that Catholics can't make good American citizens because they'll always be beholden to the Pope in Rome. Um, so James G. Blaine is proposing this amendment to keep the Catholics forever out of government. But it's one of those things that it's like, I think a lot of people today would have like be happy with the separation of church amendment. And I think there's people, uh, uh, and I think there's people that probably wish this would have passed um, even if um, maybe his reason for why was pretty bad kind of brings up that like philosophical question of what's more inten important intention or impact. Um, so although Blaine's proposed federal amendment failed, Congress did pass a law in 1875 requiring a lot of the new states to have Blaine style amendments in their state constitutions. So basically all the states you see in the yellow have separation of church and state amendments in their state constitution. The states in the red do not have separation of church and state amendments in their state constitutions. Um, so overwhelmingly, most states have separation of church and state amendments. And again, the nickname for them is Blaine Amendments, named after James G. Blaine. Um, but it gets more complicated than that because we actually just witnessed the death of separation of church and state amendments this summer here in 2022. Church and state amendments have finally been rendered null and void. They're basically useless in any state constitution now. Um, so it was a long time coming. Um, long story short, there was a lot of Supreme Court cases starting in the 1990s where the Supreme Court started chipping away the power of the separation of church and state amendments slowly over time. And that's an important thing to know. know. Uh, you know, we have the things like the Roe v. Wade overturning, which is like this dramatic shift, like with one to Supreme Court case. But so often over time, when these things happen, it's like a slowly chipping away to the point where no one notices, slowly but surely. So if you're an advocate of separation of church and state, you might not even have been aware this is happening because it happened over like 30 years. But the final um, death knell came with this Supreme Court case in 2022, Carson v. Macon. Um, this, uh, ironically, um, and I swear we didn't plan this, but this happened in Maine. So it's amazing how much of this is like Maine oriented because Maine is a very like out of the way state. Um, but basically in Maine, there are a lot of areas that are very rural and there are no public schools, but there are private schools. So students can e more easily get to these private schools. A lot of these private schools are religiously funded or parochial schools. You know, there it's a Catholic school, Baptist school, Christian school, whatever. Um, so this girl right here, she wanted to go to a Catholic school in Bangor, Maine, and she applied for a voucher to go. A voucher is basically state money to help you go attend a private school or attend school or get to school, whatever. So she, <laughs> excuse me, she wanted a voucher to go to a private school in Maine. Let me just one second. So I'm doing at the museum. Today. It was a spam call. It's a spam risk on the thing. Um, so that happens. Um, so she wanted a voucher to go to a private Christian school in Bangor, Maine. And she wanted the state to give her this voucher. The state said, we don't give vouchers to go to religious schools. That's a violation of our separation of church and state amendment. Um, uh, we, our, our, our Maine didn't have one, but that's a, we don't, we don't give um, vouchers to students who want to go to religious schools. Um, because they thought that was a uh, too much a mesh of uh, church and state. And so they sued and said that that was a violation of their freedom of religion. It's their religious freedom to go whatever school they want to. If they want to go to Christ, uh, a religious school, the state needs to help them out. And the state cannot discriminate them because they want to go to religion, school, religious schools. Um, and I hope you guys are all following this. And it's like very complicated, especially you've never like heard of this stuff. Like I had to like really read about this to understand it. Um, and the state, the, it went to the Supreme Court, and I'm sure this is no surprise to anybody listening, given our current state of the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court sided with her and said, yeah, the state violated your religious freedom by denying you a school vou uh, a, uh, a voucher to go to a religious school. So now this has opened up all these questions 
of what can now the state fund that what what now can states fund that they weren't able to fund before uh what religious organizations and institutions can states now fund that they couldn't before and this is a can of worms right um now you may have states uh um uh funding christian organizations not just schools but uh, or religious organizations in general and, and i wonder with this supreme court would they have made the same decision? And I don't mean to be too judgmental about the Supreme Court, I'm kind of showing my bias here, but I wonder if the Supreme Court would have made the same decision if this was a Muslim girl wanting to go to a uh, Muslim school. Um, would they have been okay with that? Um, or is it because it's a Catholic school and most of the, so I, so I, again, I don't mean to be, feel free to disagree. I'd just be, I have that curiosity in my head. But essentially this case, if you're having a hard time following, the thing you need to know is this case, Carson V. Macon kills um, separation of church and state amendments and state constitutions. So they're pretty much null and void now. Um, another um, interesting part of the constitution that deals with freedom of religion is article six, oops, article six, clause three. Um, and it's basically saying this, senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislators and all executive and judicial offices, both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this constitution. Now here's the important part, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So this is saying we cannot have a religious test to hold public office. You know, if you're running for a public office, I can't demand that you're a Christian. And you know, the whole swear on the Bible thing that the president does, that's not in the constitution. Um, that's just tradition. George Washington started it. But a lot of state, a lot of presidents, especially in the 19th century, refused to do it. A lot of them have chosen to um, swear on the Constitution instead of swearing on the Bible. Um, the so help me God thing that, you know, uh, you know, I swear we'll uphold the Constitution. So help me God. The president says during inauguration, that's not in the Constitution either. That's because George Washington ad-libbed it after he said it. And it was sort of like a, OK, so help me God, like sort of thing. And now it's become this tradition of uh you know every president says it but it's not in the constitution and a president could choose not to say it um so no religious test but that hasn't stopped these states in the blue um pennsylvania maryland north carolina south carolina tennessee mississippi arkansas and texas from putting in their state uh, constitutions that no atheists shall hold office in those states um now fortunately uh the constitution now supersedes state um constitutions. So these are also uh, null and unenforceable. And obviously, atheists hold positions in all of these states. But still, technically, on the books, in these states, they have this rule that says no atheists shall hold public office. And I think it might have been North Carolina that's like in this current election is trying to get that language struck out of their state constitution. Like it's like a special vote coming up in the state of North Carolina to get rid of this language in their state constitution, but I could be wrong. Don't hold me to it. I think I read somewhere that one of these states, I think it was North Carolina was doing that. Um, so is America a Christian nation? You know, Sabrina has mentioned a couple of times this idea of Christian nationalism, that America is a Christian nation founded upon Christian values. And a lot of times people will just quote things at each other. And I have some of these quotes. This is an often cited one. You have John Adams, saying the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Okay, so if you're a separation of church and state advocate, atheist, you know, or just someone who, a Christian that doesn't want religion, religion and government interviews, this is a good quote. But then you have um, David Brewer, former Supreme Court justice, in a Supreme Court decision, saying this is a religious people, this is a Christian nation. Then you have Ulysses S. Grant saying, Leave the matter of religion to the family altar, the church, and the private school, supported entirely by private contributions. Keep the church and state forever separate. So basically, Ulysses S. Grant would not be a fan of Carson V. Macon. He, he was probably rolling in his grave um, when they passed that Supreme Court decision. Um, and you have Harry Truman saying, as a Christian nation, our earnest desire, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Look at how our, all of our great values because we're a Christian nation. Doesn't end there, though. You know, Roger Williams, founder of Rhode Island, He's actually the one that came up with this analogy for the wall of separation of church and state. 
except he described it as a hedge of separation between the wilderness of the world and the garden of the church. So maybe a little overwrought, not as um, as simple as separation of church and state, but he's saying the same thing all the way back in colonial America. And of course, JFK probably was the most famous person for saying this, right? He believed in a, uh, he believes believed in America where the separation of church and state is absolute. And why was it important that JFK said this to people back in 1960? Because he was a Catholic. And again, you have people that are not that different from James G. Blaine who are worried about the Catholic influence on the U.S. government. So JFK had to deal with that baggage when he was running for president. He had to dissuade people that, okay, guys, I'm an American president. The Pope's not going to tell me what to do, blah, 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 blah. But then you have people like Ronald Reagan. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we'll be one nation gone under. And then Woodrow Wilson, America was born a Christian nation. So this is all like kind of like an over-exaggerated way of saying, relying on quotes from historical figures, maybe not the best argument for either side, because we have a lot of quotes from a lot of people who have held a lot of prominent offices in the United States saying different things. So when people start quoting at you, oh, you know, Ronald Reagan once said, like, it's not an argument because here's what JFK said, you know. And what are the religion of the founders? Because that's always the question that comes up when we're talking about Christian nationalism. You know, uh, uh, you know the, Christ the founding fathers were great Christians who attended church every Sunday and were evangelical and um, really prayed all the time. And you have that picture of George Washington praying in the snow at Valley Forge and blah, blah, blah. Um, so what were the religions of a lot of the founders? You did have a lot of hardcore Christians like Patrick Henry. Um, Patrick Henry wanted a state religion in Virginia. Him, um, he had to spar with James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson over this. It was basically him versus those two. Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison saying, nope, don't want it. And Patrick Henry saying, come on, guys, let's make it an Anglican state. Um, John Adams, he's a Unitarian. He actually converted. He was born a Congregationalist, but became a Unitarian. And if you know any Unitarians or Unitarian Universalists, they're not the most evangelical fundamentalist Christians on planet Earth. No offense. Uh, that's not a really an insult to any Unitarians, but Thomas Jefferson was a deist, rumored to be an atheist. In fact, he was rumored so hard to be an atheist that John Adams, when he ran against him in the election of 1800, was using that as a mudslinging, a mudsling against Thomas Jefferson Bank, saying, this guy's an atheist. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but Thomas Jefferson said he was a deist. And if you're not familiar with deism, deism is the idea that there is a God or a creator and that God or creator basically made the laws of science and the laws of the universe and put them in motion and then like went back to wherever they came from. Like do, they do not interact with the day-to-day -day lives of every people. So it would be like the idea that God created evolution. Like the evolutionary process was one that God initiated and started and, and, and you know, created. But God does not intercede in the everyday lives of people. You know, uh, so Thomas Jefferson would have said praying is useless because um, there's no no one's listening. Basically, they the deists compared God to a clockmaker who put the clock and got it going, got all the gears turning. And now the clock just moves by itself. Thomas Paine was an atheist. He's the famous give me or what do you say? Uh, um, he wrote Common Sense, the pamphlet during the American Revolution. You guys probably remember from like basic U.S. history class. Um, he was an atheist. In fact, he was such a hardcore atheist. He was like basically like like a public pariah, especially in Europe, um, for being an atheist and writing these atheist tracks. Um, James Madison, deist. Ethan Allen, the founder of Vermont. He's he's kind of an obscure founding father, unless you're from Vermont. But he is the fat like he's the big guy in Vermont. And he was such a deist. He was he hated organized religion, hated Christianity hated organized religion, and he wrote this really rambling, crazy manifesto called Reason, the Most Sensible Oracle of Man, or something like that. So basically saying, reason is the only God I know. And it's this very rambling like mess of a pamphlet, but he wrote it, and that's just how passionate he was about the issue. Alexander Hamilton, deist, he kind of vacillated between deism and Christian, no one really knows. But the big question is this guy, uh, George Washington. People have been fighting about what were George Washington's religious beliefs for since he died or since he was alive. He was so vague and opaque about his religious beliefs and that it was hard to like pin him anywhere. So 
my goal in writing and putting all this down is it really wasn't that they were all Christian men who were strong Christians um, because the truth is a lot more complicated than that. And their religious beliefs were varied. And really the most prominent one seems to be deism, which was very popular for their class and time. You know, if you're a rich person in, in 18th century America, deism is like really in vogue. Um, but what about this stuff? What about on the money? It says in God, we trust. And the Pledge of Allegiance says under God. Doesn't this show that we're a Christian nation? Uh, <laughs> excuse me. This stuff was added in the 1950s. Um, in God, we trust was uh, declared the national motto in 1956, which is something I lament. Really, like the de facto national motto before 1956 was e pluribus unum, out of many one, which I think is a way better motto than in God we trust. But that's just me. That's just me. Feel free to disagree. Freedom of speech. Um, but um, this was in 1956. And then the Pledge of Allegiance, when it was originally written, did not have the under God line. In fact, if you watch like all those like old time World War II propaganda videos from the U.S., it's like has a bunch of kids saying the Pledge of Allegiance. They never say under God um because this wasn't added until after world war ii so why were this why was this stuff added in the 1950s um well what's happening in the world in the 1950s it's the cold war and russia the soviet union is has state atheism so you're not allowed to have religious beliefs at least on paper in the soviet union and so america started posturing itself as the defender of religion as you know, if they're the atheists, we are the religious people. God is on our side. We will defend religion. And so we started adding in God we trust to the currency, and we added under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. But all this was done in the 1950s. So again, my point is this was not around from 1776 till the 1950s. It, it came up here and there, but it was never like formally used or used for a prolonged period of time. Um, so this was all added in the 1950s. So anybody that says, oh, you know, in God we trust um, and under God, um, those are as American as apple pie and baseball. I mean, not really. Um, so more recent and not even 100 years old. But is it a violation of the First Amendment? What about the Establishment Clause? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. What about that? Is this a violation of the Establishment Clause? Uh, courts and laws are weird. And in the United States, we have this unique law, this unique legal thing called ceremonial deism. And ceremonial deism is a fancy legal excuse we use to have things like in God we trust and under God. It's basically saying, you know, we do this, we do this God stuff. It's not really endorsing any particular religion. It's just like a like it's like a positive affirmation we're putting out there. Like in God we trust. It doesn't really mean like the Christian God. It just means like in like a higher power, like universal conscience. And if this doesn't make a lot of sense to you or sound stupid or like it's not a good argument, there's a lot of people who agree with you. And the ceremonial deism thing is something that only exists in the US. It's a very uniquely American phenomena. And it is basically an excuse to have these things. Um, maybe, maybe not the soundest legal or philosophical theory. Um, and so what was the big story from summer of 2022 court session? Roe v. Wade gets overturned. And obviously this was a, a very painful and uncomfortable and sad thing for a lot of people. Um, it was also a very happy thing for a lot of, you know, frankly, religious people. Um, because religious people were a lot of the people driving for this to happen. Um, and then we had this really uncomfortable thing in the back of everybody's minds. Um, the Catholic Church does not like abortion. And six of the nine justices on the Supreme Court are Catholic. Uh, and five are conservative Catholic. So you had this uncomfortable like question of, well, is their religious beliefs impacting their decision making? And then if you wanna take it a step further, were those 19th century bigots that were afraid of the Catholic influence on the United States government, were they right? So like you have to like, so this was like a, like in everyone's mind. And this is a conversation that like a lot of people are having. 
Uh, I think it's an uncomfortable conversation. You know, what is the Catholic influence on the Supreme Court? Is their religious beliefs impacting the way they're judging? Um, it doesn't help, you know, for a lot of people who are mistrustful of religion, it doesn't help that Joe Biden is also a Catholic. Um, that has led to all sorts of conspiracy theories. Um, so again, you have this like very 19th century conversation and this 19th century bigotry um, and this 19th century sort of like ick coming back into the 2020s. And, and like we used to say that the anti-Catholic stuff was like one of the few bigotries we've gotten over as a society. But now that we see this discourse coming back, we have to ask ourselves, is it truly gone? Like here is a meme I saw on Twitter. Um, it's the famous picture of Joe Biden, like lifting the weight while he's on the phone. Um, and it's him saying, yes, Roe v. Wade is about to be overturned. Do not worry. It is a done deal. Yes. Same sex marriage is next. Do not worry. They really believe I'm senile. Yes. I'll report back any news. Thank you, your holiness. So this meme is accusing Joe Biden of being on the phone with the Pope and taking orders from the Pope and being like a secret agent of the Pope. Um, you know, you know, implementing this Catholic uh, dogma onto U.S. government. Uh, it, it's a ridiculous, like absolutely silly meme to anybody that knows anything about Joe Biden. But um, it is a bringing back. I mean, it's like this cartoon with the Pope charging American soil with a sword, like in 2022. Um, so it's this question. It's this uncomfortable thing that's going on in our in our country. Um, you know, it's this, it's an important conversation to have, though. Um, but where's the hope? You know, a lot of people were hopeless after Roe v. Wade got overturned. Um, and a lot of people were very angry at religion and religious people, uh, especially Catholics and conservative Christians to Protestants, I guess. Um, but we should also remember that freedom of religion and religious belief and religious ideology has fueled so much of the progress and so much of the change that has happened in our country. I mean, you cannot imagine all the progressive reforms that have happened since we were found as a country without religion in a lot of ways. And like, I, you know, who is the most famous example of this? Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., right? Like, it is impossible to separate that man from his religion. Um, and, and, and would he be the same person without his religion? Probably not. Um, and there have been so many people and so many times religion has shaped our society for the better. And people have used their religious beliefs to bring about change. I mean, the Seneca Falls Convention, um, the, the convention that brought that helped spawn the women's rights movement, that began in a church in Seneca Falls. Um, you can think of all sorts of other examples. And, and I have all these pictures to sort of spur that, you know, think about times religion has fueled progressive social change in this country. Um, it's happened a lot. So as much as people have been demonizing religion, um, it's been a powerful engine for change. I mean, I have the SCLC up there, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Christians in the name. Um, so just something to think about and sort of chew over, uh, chew on and think about how can religion fuel us today and how can it fuel our congregations? How can it fuel people in a spirit of unity um, to bring about positive social change? And so that's sort of all I have. I know that was a lot. Um, I know we talked about a lot of different topics, um, but I hope that was informational and you learned something or at least got the wheels turning or it spawned some sort of thought or thinking in your head. I, I, I hope I hope it wasn't too rambly and all over the place. Sorry, that's kind of my style is very boom, boom, boom. Maxwell, that was amazing. Thank that you, was Stuart. amazing. I am so glad that we are recording this session for it to go up on our website. Okay, um, yeah. That was so amazing. I, I, one of the things that I appreciate I is your, the incredible research that you've done on this topic and really um, um looking at all the different elements like that come into the first amendment and specifically thinking about that last slide that slide that you showed about the founders i will be tweeting that out because uh -huh. i think it's so important for people <laughs> prepare, to understand prepare some for, people to hit back with you a tweet saying this is wrong this is not true <laughs> blah 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 so 
<laughs> oh, we're ready for it. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, because here, here's the thing. So many times people say, you know, that this is a Christian nation. And it was like, you've made it very clear that these founders were not, right? And so I think it's important for people to think about identity. And, and that's that's important, right? Religious identity plays a major role in, you know, how we see and navigate the world for a lot of individuals. And I think that that is a critical piece there. But there was so much that you gave when you were talking about Carson versus make it i was like yes let's talk about maine and these public yeah, I mean, it was crazy that it happened in maine it was like right up an hour away from here that school is um that was obviously how, and then we had the school prayer case this summer as well um right. that the football coach that wanted to pray on the 50 yard line and whether that was a violation of freedom of religion and all that and that's another interesting question so right. yeah lots happening um Absolutely. for people like us for groups like us we have a lot of work to do and a lot of <laughs> things to talk about yeah we do so i see there is a question in the chat um that was asked do you give virtual tours yeah so we do virtual presentations um like this similar thing um you know we need to work on our website and build a page for it but if you look at, um, uh, if you go to our website, firstamendmentmuseum.org, or just Google First Amendment Museum, you will see um, a, a tab on our, our home screen that's like education or something, and it's like virtual field trips. And we mostly do these for schools, which is why we have them on our virtual field trips. But you'll see like a long list of topics that we cover on our virtual field trips. And frankly, if there's any topic you want specifically, even if it's really niche, we can probably do it as long as it's related to something, some aspect of what we talk about. So yeah, we do these all the time and we always do them for free. So if you'd like to schedule something, um, just find my email um, and um, send me an email. We can schedule something. We can do a chat or talk. We can do it on freedom of religion, do it on freedom of speech, any of uh, freedom of the press, any of the things related to it. We do them on activism, uh, internet, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, we do. Yes, I appreciate the question. I hope to see you, uh, see your email. Absolutely. And then one of the things I would encourage you all to do is to follow them if you're on social media, because I'm not assuming everyone is. But if you're on social media, follow them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter, um, That because you can see the programming that is offered. Um, that's yeah. how I, there are a couple of programs that I've joined because I saw yeah, it which on has been Twitter. great. Thank you, Sabrina. Like it when people attend our programming. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and I tweet too. I, I just tweet about history and the current events and I always have like a little random things I find so I think my Twitter handle is in my little picture great are there any other questions comments that anyone would like to um share before uh we close out this part of the day I don't know um if you could stop the share of the video um, I just want to have everyone to join me in thanking Maxwell and the First Amendment Center for this incredible presentation about um, the First Amendment and our freedoms and how to live our freedoms. Uh, I see that the slide is still up. Um, Oh, I got it. So um, that I, it, it's such an incredible presentation on top of what Ms. Andrea shared about um, voting, voter mobilization, lobbying as a science. Like these things work together. It's important that we have all these tools in our toolkit in order to advance justice issues, to do the work that we say we're committed to doing. If we care about ourselves, if we care about the people in our lives, and that's so many different communities. So I don't know if Ms. Andrea is still here. I want to bring them both back to the screen just to say thank you. Um, I don't see, uh, is Ms. Andrea still here? Uh, it looks like she is a luck. She's gone. But um, Maxwell, again, I just want to thank, thank you. you on behalf of the Central Yeah, thanks for having us. Rec. This was great. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone who stayed in Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, we look forward to continuing this relationship. Yes. Um, so with that, I want to uh, 
Thank you. I don't have my schedule in front of me, but I will say this. I want to bring um, Michael to the screen before I give final remarks, but I think we have a slide. Uh, yes, Michael Vasquez, um, as you know, has been fully present in these last couple of days, but Michael has been behind the scenes working for several months um, to get us going with this Religious Freedom Mobile Institute, and he has served as our president project manager, um, if you were with us on that first night. You saw that Michael was the moderator for um, our discussion on Christians against Christianity, question mark. Uh, so we're so grateful for um, his genius and his being. And Michael, please join me on screen right now to give any remarks that you would like to give to our, um, to our attendees. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it quick because I know we're, it is Saturday morning and we are grateful that folks have taken that time this morning to, to hang out, uh, to learn, uh, to get some training and inspiration. Uh, and so I'm just going to give some very brief uh, closing thoughts um, as we wrap up this year's Religious Freedom Mobile Institute. I am so grateful for Andrea. I'm so grateful for Maxwell and the training they provided. Um, and as I was sitting there listening um, to the information, the insight, the wisdom, the knowledge and expertise that they brought to the table, uh, what I kept thinking about was how unique their skills are and how unique their presentations were. And looking back over the last three days, how distinct the work is that everyone who has spoken is right we have had a full range of speakers that are lawyers and clergy and organizers and theologians and scholars and uh it has been beautiful to see how everyone is working together with their unique skills different angles uh and different worldviews uh, religious beliefs, non-religious beliefs, uh, and bringing those to the table in order to support us all and our collective work to face the threat of Christian nationalism, the threats that we face to our democracy, to our rights, um, to our communities, and saying, I'm going to bring everything I have to the table. I'm going to bring my offering. You're going to bring your offering. And together, we're going to work towards a solution that works for everyone not for some members of society, not for some communities, not for some people over here to be happy and wealthy and abundant and rich and thriving, but so that everyone could come together and enjoy the beauty that is possible of a life well lived. But we can't live life well if our rights are taken away from us, if we don't have access to basic fundamental resources that the most basic things in our lives that are necessary for our survival and our thriving are affordable and accessible for everyone. And so the thought I kept having this morning was, ooh, the people are tired, but the people are working, right, together. And I want to encourage you, whether you are listening to this live right now, the, the strong few of you that made it through to the very end, thank you, uh, or if you're watching this recording, that there is no privilege class of people working towards bringing justice to our democracy, protection to our rights, and an end to the threat of Christian nationalism. No, there is, there is no special subclass. Now, some people might act a way, but you don't need to be a sociologist or a theologian or an ordained clergy or a DC-based organizer with a big old salary. You just simply need to be you bringing the skills that you have to the table. This morning, I heard a message, a short video. I'm going to figure out how to send this. Uh, a short video of a woman uh, in a small town at a hearing where they're trying to ban drag shows. Let me tell you, I love a drag show. I love being in drag occasionally. I love just going and celebrating the community. But here there is a Republican movement based on a particular kind of Christian teaching, a particular kind of anti-queer Christian nationalist teaching that says that drag shows are wrong and evil and destroying our communities. And here a woman very briefly, quickly showed up. She's like, I don't do this for a living. 
I don't come and lobby for a living. I don't come to these meetings for a living. This is not what I do uh, on the day to day. But she showed up to a hearing and said, this is foolishness. I got, it was clear from the way she was dressed and the way she was talking, she had somewhere else to be. She's not a professional lobbyist. We learned about them today. She is not a professional organizer. She's just a concerned member of the community that says the foolishness, because that's what it is, though dangerous it may be, the foolishness of Christian nationalism for making a mockery of our democracy and our rights will require every individual in our community, every one of you to show up as you can and face the threat together. This is not on me. This is not on Sabrina. This is not on Andrea Miller. Andrea has been working for too long. I want her to take a nap, right? This is not on any one individual, but this is on our collective capacity to show up to the moment and say, I believe that we can win. But the only way we can achieve that is if we all say, I am not trusting someone else over there, over in DC or over uh, in my state's capital to do the work for me, but I will come together as a community. I will join a movement and an ecosystem working towards justice. And that is when they will lose. Those who threaten our rights and our democracy and our freedoms will lose because we have just simply more numbers. We have more people, more love, more heart, and more imagination than they could possibly have. So my exhortation to you today, and I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna take my seat here in a second. My exhortation to you this morning is to simply look inward and see what do I bring to the table? Because you have something. Bring that to the table and join the fight. And then go to your neighbor and say, baby, you too. I packed us some snacks, we're going to Capitol Hill. I packed us some snacks, we're going to the march. Whatever it needs to be. Bring yourself, your neighbors, your friend, and your whole community to the moment. And that is when we will win. Thank you all. My goodness, Michael, my goodness. Like... <laughs> Those were amazing, amazing final remarks to give. Um, I thank you, Michael. Thank you for being a part of this Religious Freedom Mobile Institute. Thank you for your contribution. I am just, I am so, um, I'm so elated. I'm so elated, and I, I won't add any more because. Like as far as those remarks, because Michael has given us our call to action. And so I just ask you to, to lean into that. What I will say is this, I want to take this moment to thank every single person that attended this conference, every single sponsor and donor, and every single team member that supported us behind the scenes. And it is important for me that I name them in this moment. So I want to thank um, all of our generous sponsors and partners, the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, the First Amendment Museum, U Union Theological Seminary, Wesley Theological Seminary, Network Lobby, Star King School for the Ministry, the Open Church of Maryland, uh, the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative at Vanderbilt Divinity School, Chicago Theological Seminary, Interfaith Alliance, Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign, Union Presbyterian Seminary, Wake Forest School of Divinity. And I even want to thank those individual sponsors, Christina Lee, Umi An, Rosemary Tresp, and Mandisa Thomas, and so many others who gave of their own personal resources to support this event, as well as Joan Neal. Um, I, I also want to thank Union Presbyterian Seminary's tech team. Um, unfortunately, Sam was not able to join us because uh, she had death in her family and then also became ill herself. And so we're sending positive thoughts um, to Sam and healing wishes for you during this very difficult time for you and your family. I also want to thank uh, my CFG 
JR team, Michael Vasquez, Beth McMahon, uh, Dr. Corey D.B. Walker, um, Katia Pedyesh, and also the board that supported me in making this event um, possible. And also our friends at Grandview Strategies, um, Sophie Hersha and Dorsky, who helped with the graphics and Blair Forlaw and Kelvin Bui, who were there at the at the foundation when we said, OK, let's make this happen this year. What is the title? What are we going to do? And so it took so many people to make this possible, as well as all of our speakers um, that joined us, Dr. Aubrey Hendricks, uh, Reverend Paul Rochenbush, Amanda Tyler, Michael Vasquez, um, Liz Reiner Platt, uh, Reverend Alex Patchen McNeil, Mandisa Thomas, Andrea Miller, um, Lauren Lowe Relliford, uh, Rabbi Dania Ruttenberg, uh, Reverend Jamar Boyd, uh, Victoria Kirby York, Nicole Lee, Dr. Brad Braxton, Dr. Uh, as well as Harmeet Cambodge, PJ Andrews, Dr. Corey D.B. Walker, Becca Tyvel, um, Maxwell Nobish, and again, Ms. Andrea Miller. All of you brought so much richness to this Religious Mobile Institute. And I just want to thank all of you. And I want to encourage you, um, if you want to stay connected, to follow us on social media um, at Center for Faith 2. And then also you can follow us on Facebook, um, as well as we encourage you to support the center. If you want to give donations, we will welcome that. Um, and the last thing is we have another event coming up. Um, we have an event coming up on November the 1st. There is a screening of the documentary, American Heretics, The Politics of the Gospel. This is a film that you don't want to miss. If you, uh, with the combination of everything that you learned from this conference and what we see happening in the public square, this is the story of what has happened in Oklahoma. And so we encourage you to, if you haven't, thank you, ML, for already registering. If you haven't registered, please register today. This is a free screening. Our thing is to make sure that you have the tools and the resources to really understand. And our presenters unpack this in various ways over the last three days. But join us for this film screening. We are honored that the filmmakers will be joining us for this conversation, as well as the leaders from our partner institutions, which are Wake Forest Divinity School, Union Presbyterian um, Seminary, and their Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation, and Chicago Theological Seminary. So don't miss this event. It's 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 1st. That is one week before midterm elections. So make sure you're ready for the midterm elections as well. With that, those are my final remarks. And I just wanna say again, thank you to all of you, to those that are watching this recording. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We look forward to seeing you in the future for our programming and um, continue to do your work. Continue to do your work, take action. But you know, we all have a part to play in reimagining religious freedom and respecting the rights and, and taking responsibility and doing so respectfully. So with that, I say thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah, it's just us. <laughs>